So welcome everyone to the Co-Creators Convergence, Up Convergence, Unity and Peace. I'm Noelle Marshall with the Co-Creators Convergence, and we are bringing, coming upon our final hour of a seven-day broadcast. And Laurie Timmerman has been bringing us uh, such, you know, just bringing beautiful information. I hope she has a, a wrap up too, like Karen did. That was awesome because, uh, you know, my, my brain is um, on fire. But let me tell you a little bit about Laurie and then she may inter introduce her guest. And uh, Bob and I are anxiously awaiting to, to hear from uh, uh, Laurie's guest. So Laurie is a global development specialist and visionary thinker with over 28 years of experience focusing on global issues of sustainable development, agriculture, food systems, energy environment, climate change, women's empowerment, democratization, and community bill of rights, demilitarization, and world beyond war peace advocacy. Lori has managed US food aid and rural livelihood programs in four African countries for a total of three years. As headquarters program manager and results reporting specialist with Africare in Washington, D.C., she assisted in coordinating rural health and water projects in Africa. With IDE in Denver, Laurie served as an HQ coordinator supporting rural livelihood programming in Asia and Africa. She also worked as a research or administrative assistant with several multilateral finance institutions for over six and a half years. Laurie graduated from Columbia University with a master's degree in global economic and political development and earned her undergraduate degree in international affairs and political science at Wilmette University in Salem, Oregon. So, I thank you, Noelle. That was uh, very nice of you, and welcome to this seventh and last uh, Peace Hour. We really have a very uh, rare treat tonight as we discuss the topic of peace journalism. And we have with us uh, Su Susan Beaver Thompson. Uh, Susan. So, uh, welcome, Susan. Thanks. And so, uh, Susan is a visionary businesswoman, independent journalist, social activist, and she calls herself a free agent. <laughs> so um, Susan has spent 20 years in corporate America with major companies like TRW, Ernst Young, Mid-American Energy, and Hertz Media. And she was an award-winning reporter and managing editor for local and regional news outlets. As a marketing and business development director, she negotiated numerous multi-million deals, and she also taught writing at community colleges. Susan has been directly involved in politics, in, including she even served as an Iowa delegate to the 1996 Democratic National Convention. Uh, since 2000, Susan has struck out on her own as a digital marketing pioneer. And this was her desire, was to champion the common people. And so her work took on an activist tone and peace building became her passion. She studied how social change and social justice can be brought about through the use of technologies such as smartphones and social media, which she began to apply publicly when she went to her first mobile peace journalism trip in 2013. Since 2013, Susan has written spoken extensively about how to use the latest communication technologies to bring about peace. In 2017, 2018, uh, Susan ventured out on additional peace journalism treks covering the MLK Martin Luther King 50th conference among other national events. In 2019, she served as the peace building and interfaith outreach consultant for Marion Williamson in her presidential campaign. And uh, Susan has graduated from communications from the 
University of California, Santa Barbara, and gained her, earned her master's in business English at Col California State in Pomona. So uh, what I'd like to just kind of start with to just cue this up a little bit is, you know, this context and background for um, the state of the media today. Um, we've, we've had seen a media consolidation with uh, the really large corporate media outlets consolidated into uh, six uh, uh, corporate um, media entities. And there's a sense or there's a trend of, of co-opting media integrity um, on uh, mainstream media can tend to glorify violence, uses war terminology, um, can dehumanize the others, and serve as a cheerleader for the drumbeat of war. Um, this, so Susan, uh, let me just ask you our first question here. Just what is peace journalism, and what is its purpose and its primary tenets? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'd like to pull up a couple slides I have, if that's okay with you guys. Um, I, I can share some of the pioneers of peace journalism as well. So bear with me here, and I will do that. All right, um, Lynch and McGoldrick, they're two of the pioneers. They're in Australia and they are professors, they're researchers, and they really have formed the modern definition of peace journalism. Um, and they say it's when editors and reporters make choices that create opportunities for society at large to consider and value nonviolent responses to conflict. All right, so um, the peace journalism is a little different from, for instance, an expose, um, and it has to do with the intent of the journalists, the intent of that piece. Uh, so um, peace journalism really isn't about trying to expose or um, nece necessarily condone or condemn any particular side. Its purpose is to show all sides of a conflict, to not oversimplify, to use uh, nonviolent language, to bring across solutions for peace in any given situation. So, you know, I mean, we, we usually consider we think about peace versus war. And originally when peace journalism came out, um, it was just mainly focused on, you know, reporters covering war zones. But now in our, our modern society, it, it's with any kind of conflict. So, you know, I, I would consider peace journalism a subset of uh, social justice journalism, for instance. Okay, and um, the purpose is to actually model peace in the way we write, the way we communicate, the way we interview people, for instance, for stories. And I'll, I'll get a little into that in just a sec. Um, and to really give, um, have the focus be on what's happening to resolve peace. So it, it's part of solutions journey. Uh, let me sort of just go to the next slide and just give you a little uh, background. Uh, Johan uh, Galtig is the father of peace journalism. He started it in a, the 1960s. Um, he's out of Norway. And you'll see when you look up peace journalism, pretty much everything. He has a, a website called Transcend Media. Okay. Dr. Jake and Annabelle are in Australia, and they're one of the leading proponents. Um, they're also university researchers. And then my friend, Stephen Youngblood, 
He is the director of the Center for Global Peace Journalism, and that's at Park University. And it's really the, the main university in the United States that actually has a peace journalism major. This is a comparison of um, war, what war journalism versus peace journalism. Um, I, I guess what I would say is, it, once again, it applies to all forms of conflict, not just traditional war. Um, so if we would look at some of the differences, um, in peace journalism, we are looking at all parties in a situation or a conflict, okay? We're not just uh, condemning one side and and showing value of the other. Uh, we definitely want to avoid a them versus us type of mentality. Uh, we're giving voice to all parties and looking at all sides of a conflict. Uh, we're looking at what people are for, not what people are against. And then the thing I would say is, as with any type of journalism, the language we choose is really, really important in terms of choosing nonviolent language. Uh, and I mean, we're so um, programmed in terms of what we see in the media and how people report, especially now with all the polarizations, that sometimes we don't even um, recognize when we're using language that's based on war because our economy, our polarization, uh, our culture is right now, some people consider it a war culture as opposed to a peace culture. So we're using peace journalism to help bring in a peace culture, a peace economy, a peace mentality. And all of that starts with the journalist and the journalist actually being peace and embodying peace and checking out their biases and checking out their intentions uh, before they write and then looking at the words, the headlines, the pictures to make sure that they're giving all sides. They're talking to everyday people, not just leaders or elite. And they're letting the audience there decide what they believe. Um, so Anyway, that, you know, that's, that's how I would consider the differences between them. Um, I have some more tips, but why don't we go okay. back in whatever next questions you have for me. Um, I'm excited about being here. How did you get involved in peace journalism? And what are the most significant lessons you've learned and would like to share with others? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, you know, sometimes when people ask me how I got involved or why, um, I've always been interested in this. Uh, peace journalism has a lot to do with negotiation, with collaboration. And, um, you know, I did my master's on getting to yes from the Harvard Negotiation Project. And that focuses on principles of negotiation. Um, also Carl Rogers and a Rogerian approach in looking at your quote enemies as allies. Okay. And looking at common interests, focusing on, focusing on interests rather than personality or positions, um, exploring options. Okay. Rather than just coming to, uh, superficial, um, assumptions or programmed assumptions. And so when I was in Wilmington, North Carolina, I was teaching uh, at Cape Fear Community College. And I just felt so strongly about what I was seeing. And with my journalism background, I just decided, Susan, get up off your couch and get out there and do something about it. 
And a lot of the mobile type of, you know, like uh, social media, video, and later live streaming was becoming popular as ways to, to communicate rather than just blogs or articles or whatever that I had been writing. And so I decided in 2013 to take off uh, in my car at that point and um, look, uh, travel, go to peace events, meet peace builders, because so many times we don't talk about peace builders. Um, you know, let's model the peace. That pe there's so many people that are already doing wonderful peace community projects. And, you know, having within our media the covering of people that are modeling that and doing that, uh, you know, rather than us just getting into reporting based on, you know, us versus them. Um, you know, and that really, it, you know, research has shown that, that when people read and look at that type of material, they really, they, it really changes their mind. It puts them in a different mindset. Um, one example I would give is I don't know if you guys have heard about these guys, but uh, the, the website's called Invisible People. And what they're working on is homelessness. And instead of just writing about homelessness, all of their videos, and they're mainly video oriented, they have some you know, text, but they're mainly video oriented. And most all of their, all of their videos are firsthand videos of people who are actually homeless uh, in very different situations, in different places of different ages. And the focus is on giving the voice to the homeless and showing it real, like, you know, ha having people tell their stories. So storytelling, you know, obviously that's become very popular within content development. And, and that's always been a part of peace journalism because we wanna show real people and what they're doing and what they're facing. So Invisible People is a great example of social journalism, peace journalism. Okay. So you just mentioned, um, it seems like uh, we, we have a, a permanent war culture in the US and in the world. Uh, practically speaking, what does it mean to shift to a peace culture? And what are some practical steps of how we can get there? Um, so um, there is a lot of peace journalism that's happening all over the world. And there's peace education going on about training journalists in all different countries to be able to um, be peace journalists when conflict is going on in their countries. All right. And so um, my main feeling is that that's great, but that we have to start in the United States. Um, as you guys know, the United States has by far the biggest military budget and by far in terms of the number, and I'll, I want to quote it right, but right now, uh, two thirds of our US federal discretionary spending in the US goes to war, military. And since 1990, $7 billion worth of military equipment has been transferred to local police departments. Okay? So this is showing us that here in the United States, we have to be leaders in communicating about peace and in peace journalism because the changes that need to happen have to happen here because of what I just said in terms of how our militarization affects our country, our community, and the world. Uh, so that's one thing I really believe is that we have to focus on that. Um, the process I've seen, and it's very personal. When I, when I set out in 2013 as a peace journalist, 
I really still had a us versus them mentality. I was calling people warmongers. All right. I was talking about us versus them. And very soon I learned that that doesn't work at all. Not only are the people just really sick of us cutting each other down and talking about who and what we're against, they want to they wanna hear and want to get involved in what we're for. You know, what are we for? So the social change type of process that I see happening and the shift that needs to take place in our journalism is one that starts from personal peace, moves to our family, which is oftentimes cha challenging, moves to community projects, and those, especially with peace journalists and regular everyday people on their smartphones, okay, they can take pictures, they can feature peace builders. They, right now, we have more power than ever before and people are starting to get engaged. So let's give them positive stories about what's working. So, you know, it goes from then the local level to national to let's look at the earth. Because right now, I mean, you guys have all heard about the space force that was recently created. And I'm very concerned that if we don't get our act together here on earth, already in the stated aims of the space force, we are seeing war and a war mentality being brought into space. And I mean, that's up to us. We're people on earth. If we're going out into space, we need to be going out in peace. So we need to get our shit together, as I would say. And, you know, here on this planet, so we don't pollute the rest of the galaxy with a war mentality and war approach. Um, it's a real opportunity for us here. Well, I have, I have a related question and um, kind of uh, using the term leverage points, like how can we bring about ch changes in government policies and public opinion to uh, counter this control that the military industrial complex has on our society? And how can we use these leverage points uh, to support peace. So what are the, uh, you know, th things that can uh, in influence this whole dialogue? All right. Um, well, it's many of the things I've been talking about. Um, some of the ways, and uh, let me make sure I have this right, um, because I wanted to tell you guys about this. Um, there's, there's different uh, peace journalism techniques uh, that are really good for doing this. Uh, one uh, is called widen the lens. Okay. And what okay, that I'm is, taking notes. I'm taking notes. <laughs> uh, widen the lens is when, for instance, there's a story in uh, buffalonews.com. It was a story about uh, how they can improve their schools. All right. So they did a whole series. Uh, obviously the focus is on how can they improve what's going on with the Buffalo schools. But what they did is they ran a whole series and they looked at the problems of urban education in a number of different other areas of the country. And for instance, they wrote one about uh, LA school kids and how the LA Unified School District is focusing on truancy and on attendance. And they found that those are the two areas. So once again, instead of just getting so much into the fight between or about a certain thing, to widen the lens and show the issue on a broader base 
and then come around and tell the stories, the local stories. That's one really good technique that works well. Um, the other one, um, it, and uh, I wanted to share that one with you too. And that one's called Complicating the Narrative, which sounds really weird, but complicating the narrative is just that. So many times we see, um, and once again, okay, let's say someone says by a bipartisan approach, okay? There aren't just two parties. Multi-party approach, okay? Or nonpartisan approach. We're so tied to what we see in terms of the going back and forth of Democrats and Republicans, for instance, that bipartisanship is lauded rather than nonpartisanship or um, championing for the people, for instance. Um, so with complicating the narrative, what you do is specifically ask questions to all of the parties involved. And once again, not just getting quotes from the director of this organization or this politician or whatever, but being able to ask questions to all sides and to show, for instance, the paradoxes, the disagreements, the, um, you know, the, the discrepancies, the, um, yeah, between the, the parties and to have every, you know, regular everyday people giving examples of these things so that we don't just show a simplistic uh, picture to our readers or listeners, but we show one that has depth and examples and shows real people rather than just policymakers. Uh, and I've seen a lot of this good type of journalism being done, for instance, with COVID. And like here in Nevada, we're having terrible problems with our, like a lot of places, with the unemployment not getting out still to people that have waited like four months for it. So instead, as a journalist, instead of just talking about, you know, what a mess the unemployment system is in Nevada, showing uh, stories in their own words from different types of people and how they've been affected from it. Um, so, you know, we can do that in, in many areas. Um, so anyway, that, those are two, two of the techniques a journalist or anyone can use. Thank you. So just to follow in this line of inquiry here, um, and you mentioned about the us versus them and about partisanship, um, how do we practice peace when people are so polarized and divided and are resorting to um, uh, name calling and uh, you know other aggressive behaviors? Um, I think that the best way is to model it in our approach. Don't just give people what is the, the basic. And I mean, if you listen to any kind, uh, most all of at least the major news sources, even the headlines are just totally biased. Um, and so to be able to, as a journalist, first of all, check out my motivation and intention. As I write, is my intention to be able to bring out all parties and give readers and listeners um, a total 360 of the issue? Or is my you know, intent to be able to prove that one side is right and one side is wrong. Okay, so even the words anti-war, okay? We had the anti-war movement obviously in the 60s and 70s, okay? Being anti-anything never accomplishes us moving forward. But um, 
So many of the things that we're talking about in terms of, you know, this doesn't happen overnight, like with any kind of social change, but our intent to be able to show solutions to an issue and to show all sides in an issue okay. is what's key. Okay, thank you. And so uh, what is the connection between nonviolence and peace building and social justice, um, kind of the, the nexus between those? Okay. Um, social justice, obviously, is many different issues of which peace is one. I personally see, and I mean see, I personally see that peace could be the overall way, the overall umbrella to change a number of different issues. I mean, lately, you know, with policing, with racial issues, with immigrants, how can we take a peace building overall approach like we've been talking here, rather than seeing, always talking about conflicting sides, okay? So I believe that peace journalism is part of, of social change, uh, it certainly involves nonviolent communication principles. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, nonviolence means avoiding not only external physical violence, but also internal violence of spirit. You not only refuse to shoot a man, but you refuse to hate him. That goes down to where a writer is writing from. Um, when I taught college and we would work on a persuasion paper, okay, so many of the students wanted to convince everyone to move. Let's say someone's on a scale from one to 10, okay, and 10 is that they're totally going to agree with what you've written. Okay, not so. Even if you bring a couple people to two or three, you've accomplished change. And you're not the only one talking to that person. And so it's incremental and it builds on each other. And we teach each other how to write from a place of peace, from a place of collaboration. So, um, using this nonviolent communication and neutral communication, uh, peace oriented languaging, does this mean that we, uh, it gives an impression that we are soft or we are weak and we're not stridently, you know, enough standing up for what's right or giving those who are promoting um, harmful policies, you know, a past that we're not? really stridently taking them on? You know, that, that is a question I look at all the time. Um, once again, if one is presenting all points of view, one is getting direct quotes and presenting and telling stories from all points of view, a reader or a listener is going to see that it's not biased toward one thing or another. So I really believe that, and I've seen that this approach actually um, helps people change. Because like for instance, Carl Rogers in his Rogerio approach, he taught that you bring someone that's against you you can present your ways and best change them, perhaps, by being comprehensive, by not talking down to them, 
by not making it too simplistic or making it uh, black and white. And so when people see this, they, they respond very positively. And, and it doesn't just work for journalism. Once again, this pro, uh, what I have seen is one needs to embody peace and write from that, just as you would be doing a peace building project in your neighborhood or whatever. So you're applying those nonviolent skills, um, the non-judgmental skills. And one can still not agree with someone, but present their view. Uh, and, and we're not seeing enough of that. And I, you know, peace journalism really has the power to move us toward a peace culture. So uh, from our chat, we have a question. Um, what are some good sources for peace news that you could recommend? Absolutely. The best source I have found is an organization called the Solutions Journalism Network. And it's solutionjournalismnetwork.org. They have uh, a page on their website and it's called the Solution Story Tracker. And they literally have hundreds of solution journalism uh, writing. And there's also TED Talks, there's videos. Um, it doesn't just apply to text, but there's tons of examples on there and they're broken down into all different types of social issues. That's a really good place to start. Um, Peace Digest Magazine, Peace Journalist Magazine, both of those are online. Um, any of the nonviolent communication pages. Uh, also, the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, they have an excellent resources chapter. They, for instance, uh, with all this homeschooling going on, the very, one of the very best things we can do is give our kids training in nonviolent communication. And they have a whole curriculum on there. And, and I would tell you in dealing with other peace journalists and journalism and other being involved in adult education, we need this for an adults too. <laughs> we don't always, you know, our interpersonal skills in terms of that can get be stronger, you know, and anything we can do for our own inner peace and how we relate to other people, that's reflected. If someone is writing from the heart and with the intent to show what the solutions, the positive solutions are, are then it comes across. Pe people are sophisticated in the way that they take in news. And they have just gotten used to uh, us versus them mentality. And let's change that, you know? Okay, on a similar uh, line of questioning, so what groups and organizations have you seen doing a good job in um, modeling uh, peace journalism? And how can there be more collaboration? How can peace builders uh, collaborate more amongst themselves? Well, I think this uh, event that we're participating in right now is a great example because there's people from all aspects of uh, peace activism, peace building, um, and, you know, and the peace journalism is one aspect of peace activism. And so I believe that bringing organizations together to host events, online education, okay, because there's so many good organizations. And I have observed that sometimes the organizations work in a vacuum. And, you know, we, we need to do more in, in joint programs and, and that kind of thing. Um, the Solutions Journalism Network does have a training. They offer a one hour free training. Uh, they do it about once a month. The next one is October 1st. 
So if you go on, um, you know, their website, you can sign up for that free. It's a great introduction and um, students go on there too and talk. So um, there's a whole host of examples. Um, okay, so uh, if we would like to uh, open up and see if anyone listening would like to have uh, ask Susan their questions. All right. Oh, hi, Susan. Noelle here. Hey, hey Noelle. Good nice to, to see, see you. Again. Yeah, thank you for doing this. Um, I was just wondering, um, what are you doing now? Are, you mentioned you, you, used to, you taught. Are you still involved in peace journalism? And how does that look? Yes, I am. Um, I, it's sort of taken a different focus during COVID because, of course, I'm, you know, my peace journalism is mobile peace journalism. So I, I, I'm doing work with the Oakland Peace Center and writing their business and communication plan. And that's something that I've been able to do during COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. I am planning to go out on some more peace journalism treks. Um, but in the meantime, I've been doing that. I wrote for Peace Journalist Magazine. Um, I've shared in a number of interfaith organizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. For instance, with the Unity Church, I've spoken at a number of Unity services. And Lori mentioned I was also able to work with Marianne Williamson on her peace building initiatives with the Department of Peace, with the Outreach to Interfaith uh, publications and organizations. Um, and Interfaith, even if someone's not, quote, religious, Interfaith organizations, uh, you know, instead, once again, of focusing on the, what we believe in this religion and what we believe in that religion, we're looking for the universal human rights, the integrity of the person, and what do all of those faiths have in common? What can we agree on? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it, actually the interfaith movement is they're having to do, or they're getting to do, once again, language, getting to do what we'll be doing, we are doing with peace journalism. So anyway, that's, that's some of the things I've been doing. Um, one other thing I'd Sounds like to like mention. Sounds like you've been busy. <laughs> well, I have. And my so son, I, I didn't know whether Frank had a question. We're getting a little short on time. So I wanted to make- Hey, Frank, how are you? I see you out there. In. Well, I was just thinking that, you know, once you understand that you want peace and you write stuff, like you've written lots of things or you give a talk, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, they don't get it. They don't get it. You know, it takes years and years and years before maybe something finally clicks. I, it's a very frustrating business piece. I mean, I, I, I've done a range of things in my life, including being a college professor. And, you know, the idea is it's like, you know, sometimes it doesn't click in until five, ten years later. Absolutely. And I it's think a long-term thing. Yeah, I think you know, as a spiritual pathway, it's, it's a real challenge. I agree with Frank. Can you hear me now? It's a long-term proposition. So I think it takes po personal motivation and um, focus and intent. So it almost makes you wonder if we have enough time, you know, just it, it, to do that. I mean, one of the things that people don't talk about that really defines our world is nuclear weapons. Absolutely. And so one of the signs that we don't know as much about nuclear weapons as you think is you can find information on the web. Well, it's not on the web unless it's sort of almost irrelevant. But, you know, North Dakota is the third most powerful nuclear nation in the world. Who would have thought that, right? And because they have all these silos in the ground. And they try to tell you that, oh, they've all been deactivated, that it's not true. Yeah, well, absolutely. So, um, so you know, you have to, you, in a sense, that this being a peacemaker is a faith journey. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a rational thing. You know, people are going to, you know, you say things to people that's in their own benefit, but they don't recognize that. You know, the, this war mentality that we have, it's sort of run its course. 
we're as an as an we have military people in every continent in the in the world except Antarctica by treaty. Mm -hmm. I mean, they Paul Chappelle writes a lot of this about this, and I know he's a presenter doing during this, but. Um, Absolutely, and people can use their smartphones, for instance. Um, I, like, for instance, when the Space Force came out, okay? Just to be, you know, able to respond and retweet a story. And I'm not sure if you guys can hear me, but being able We're to- We're hearing you. Okay, right now, people are listening to activists. Okay, it's finally happened. So I actually, Frank, I totally agree with you. Sometimes it's easier just to do it uh, like we've been doing it before in terms of reporting um, or in terms of getting anything done um, or in terms of resolving, for instance, a conflict within a family. It's uncomfortable sometimes, but it moves us all forward together. Um, yeah, so um, we promised in our, in our ad for our presentation that we would, uh, that you would share with us how Americans can get involved with peace journalism through their smartphones and social media. So you said uh, forwarding um, posts on Twitter, uh, so what, what other, avenues would you suggest? Uh, YouTube, Twitch TV, getting on and live streaming about projects in the area. Okay, um, being able to put out videos, you know, like for instance, like invisiblepeople.org uh, that I mentioned to you. Um, and really challenging the status quo. Uh, and this is the first time in history that people can go directly to quote the airwaves. Huge opportunity and something that even 10 years ago wasn't possible. Um, so, you know, just like someone would um, take a picture of their food and post it. We need to get used to people when they see something that they disagree with being able to actually take a video and put it up. And we've seen how those type of things are starting to change uh, policies. Um, it has to do with peace builders running for office. Um, those type of things. And Frank, you're right. I mean, it's sometimes easier just to do something by ourselves than to take the, the time it takes to negotiate that process. But that's what brings people in and it also teaches them at the same time. Um, so it's a process of, you know, sharing and learning and teaching what, what works, you know. Okay, well, we are at the top of the hour. So this is where, um, <laughs> this is where, um, it's just like an open mic, open forum, like anything else that you just want to leave with people now listening to this and uh, the people that will listen in future replay. Um, just that the way we communicate comes from our own internal peace. So I have noticed that how strong I am and how consistent I am with my spiritual practices definitely affects the way I communicate with others, both, you know, in person and on paper. Well, that little profound nugget that you left us with, <laughs> it uh, says it all and, and could be a, another conversation for a whole nother hour. <laughs> it could. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for including me. I would, you. I would always love to talk about this. Well, thank you, Susan, for taking your time to prepare, you know, and, and uh, to share with us. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Susan. And uh, I want to say 
A special thank you to Laurie for hosting so beautifully seven hours of uh, the peace hour and uh, all the, Laurie, do you want to just uh, briefly recap the, the guests and things you talked about this week? So yeah. entice people to go back and look at the rest. Yeah, okay. Everything will be recorded and put on our website, cocreatorsconvergence.com. After we do a little sleeping and processing of all the videos, that's going to take <laughs> after 80 hours of recording. So go ahead, Laurie. Okay. Uh, yeah, we started out with a very seminal study, and it's a guide. And it's a comprehensive, like, if we want an alternative security system. So when we say we're for peace, we still are for security. So it's like, what does a non-militarized security system look like in all its aspects? And from there, we turn to like a specific, uh, looking at the burden of war, the cost of war, and bearing witness to it. This is a very heavy topic. It's, and so it's like, instead of shying way to, to um, give it, it's due to engage with it, but engage with our hearts, and with our compassion. So we delved into uh, the World War I in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, and, and also with the US role in creating as uh, an imperial um, power, how it does uh, its form of imperialism is through false flag events. No, it's, it's through regime change operations. So we, we touched into that. Then the next, day to really go to the solution space is like if we weren't spending money on uh, all of these wars on all of this uh, 55 60 66 percent of our budget going to military the peace dividend what we could spend it on domestically but but for our international development assistance program that spending money for um, we looked at the extreme inequality of wealth in the world and, and programming money to meet human uh, needs in the poorer countries is absolutely peace creation. Um, from there, we had a, uh, a preview, an advanced preview with Eleanor Lacane talking on breakthrough policies, which um, she did very well because it was also an ad, uh, advanced preview of her book of uh, an America that works for everyone. So we explored the health issues, the ec economics and uh, climate change. And so on Wednesday, I um, had a real delight in bringing a personal friend of mine who like Bob and Noel are, is a spiritual activist who founded her foundation for healing among nations and just very closely um, listened to her inner guidance and showed up in amazing rooms that were very pivotal for interfaith healing, healing of Holocaust survivors and, uh, you know, and uh, working with conflicts in the Middle East, just as one person. <laughs> so that was very, very inspiring. So last night I got to share um, a little bit of my own perspective. It was like a reflection. And I, since I worked my whole life in the international development field, I just uh, said it's much more fun to be a global citizen. What does that mean? It means to be multicultural. It's really fun to not other the other, to, to be friends, to um, celebrate diversity, to travel, to go to other cultures. and um, what does that speak to? It speaks to one humanity. It speaks to oneness. It speaks that we're, we all breathe the same air. We all have the same emotions. We all have the same physiology that we're, you know, we're one people and to embrace this diversity and, um, and, and then ending on the note of cooperation. And just so you know, um, tomorrow, uh, Tomorrow, uh, I, what, who I mentioned was uh, Rian Eisler with the Center for Partnership Studies. And tomorrow she's featured in a uh, session on women's empowerment for the SHIFT Network. 
And then at five o'clock on the East Coast time, she is featured as a keynote speaker in building the new world conference. <laughs> so, and so the, uh, the pièce de résistance or the feather in the cap is Susan joining us here um, with the, you know, that our words are so important of how we speak to each other, how embracing we are, um, that sets the tone and that sets the dynamic of human relations. I told you she brought up a lot of uh, fantastic presentations on peace. And just one final thing before we, we close, Laurie, I want to express my gratitude on behalf of the co-creators convergence and the up convergence. Uh, I want to uh, want you to let people know uh, if they wanted to have you come and talk and do one of your presentations, how would they get a hold of you? Um, well, I have my private email, which is uh, Laurie, L-A-U-R-I-E, uh, D for middle initial Diane. And Timmerman is too long, so then it's T-I-M-M, -M, you know, and then at gmail.com. So Laurie, D-T-I-M-M, -M, at gmail.com. Thank you, Laurie. I put it in the, uh, in the chat there. So I want to thank everyone for coming. It seems unbelievable, but seven weeks of, I mean, seven days of broadcast now is complete. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. And all of this was leading up to the Peace Weekend. So uh, there is, if you go to peaceweekend.org, uh, there's going to be um, three days now of more programs. And it ends on uh, the 21st of September which is United Nations, uh, the International Day of Peace. So that's why this, we were just kind of leading up to that celebration. So if you go to peaceweekend.org, you'll be able to find all the schedules. And I wanna thank everyone for coming. And um, this, I just feel really blessed by all the co-creators that brought this all together. And so thank you, Laurie. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Frank, Sue, Adrian, Karen. So Let's give a big round of thanks to Bob and Noel for doing this whole thing and putting it on for Well, we better bring Bob in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. It's been a wonderful week. We Master organizers. <laughs> thank you. We look forward to seeing all of you through weekend, through Peace Weekend, and all the uh, global broadcast events, some really amazing things movie premieres, music premieres. It's going to be a great weekend. So peace on. <laughs>